remain standing for the reading of God's Word according to Luke's Gospel, first chapter beginning with the 26th verse. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and he will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who has been said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May God add God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, to the understanding of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I'm hoping that over the last few weeks that we have been together, we've reframed a little bit of how you look at Christmas um, when you approach to, to coming to a time in which it is uh, not simply a, a time just about giving and, and getting gifts despite what the, the children said. That is part of the season and part of the joy that we have, but there is so much more. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the fact that Christmas is not your birthday. And, we, and I challenged you, offered up a challenge for those who are here that to possibly give away just as much as you spend this uh, holiday season. We'll have a couple of, of opportunities for you to do that and in the next couple of weeks we'll take up an offering on our Christmas Eve at all three of our Christmas Eve services. So um, really more than anything else for us to learn that this season is not about us at all but rather what God is doing in redeeming the world by sending God's own Son to live among us. I think this becomes even more prominent, and our attention is drawn to this if we actually admit to ourselves that Christmas is extremely stressful and hectic. I mean, we're sort of in the home stretch. I guess next week, technically, the 21st will be the home stretch. Uh, but but, but we're, we're getting, getting closer. And so while the excitement, especially for the little ones, increases, the anxiety for those of us who are not so little, notice I didn't say old, but not so little, increases. You see, we've turned Christmas into a, a list of things to be done to be marked off rather than to in simply enjoy the fact that we do these at all and for the reason that is behind them. And hopefully we're making room for Christ to be born anew in our own lives. Now some of you, some of us, we have our lists. And so we go through our list, and, 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 and it seems like that list is never ending, mainly because every time we cross one thing off, we add two more, and, and, and it seems like we're never going to get to the end of it by the time Christmas Day gets here. It's about a list of things to do. This echoes the f trap that we fall into when it comes to our life of faith in general. I I'm recalling the, the story that many of you know and love from Luke 10 in which it's Mary and Martha's story. 
Because I think this is what we've done to, to Christmas to a large extent, is we find this story of Jesus coming to visit the sisters, and, and of course Martha is frantically cleaning the house, getting preparations made. Can anybody relate to that? Some of you have already had Christmas with your family, and so you frantically cleaned your house trying to get it ready for the family that would come in town. Some of you are, are dreading that in the next couple of, of days or in the next week that you have to do all of these things. Some of you are a lot like Martha. And in that story, you remember that she, she gets mad because she looks over and her sister Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, not helping. Now I have a sister, and I know what that's like. To look out and to see the sister not lifting a single finger while I do all the work. And I got mad and said, come on, mom, dad, make them, make her help. Which is the same thing Martha does. Come on, Jesus, make Mary help me. To which Jesus simply and politely responds, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen that which is better. And that will not be taken away from her. That which is better. Not, it's, not a, it's not a good versus bad. She didn't choose something that was bad. She just chose what was better. Sitting and being present and breathing in the, the experience of Jesus being there. What, what, what does that look like for us to simply be present in this holiday season? Present with one another making ourselves available to be used by God in another sense. See, we're, we're chasing perfection. We've, we've, we've bought into the magazines that tell us that Christmas has to be looking like this. You know, whatever magazine you ascribe to, that, that Christmas needs to, to look like this. And so as we get closer and closer, it becomes more and more stressful. Now, this whole idea is, is played out in what is many people's favorite Christmas movie, Christmas Vacation. I want to show you just a very small clip because there's only a few clips I could show you. So I'm going to show you a very small clip. Um, Lee, you got it fired up so for the, me. The next to the last scene is them driving away and they've, they've sort of had to dig out the base of the, of the tree. The whole movie is, is this way, of this idea of, of he wants, Clark wants to have the perfect Christmas and, 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 and it and is anything, anything, uh, isn't anything close to that. Th this embodies what a lot of people experience. And, and some of you, some of you, uh, you haven't experienced this. Some of you have had perfect Christmases since the day you were born. And, 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 and so what I want you to do is I want you to hear this and think to yourself, maybe one day my Christmas won't measure up. And that's okay too. This whole series that I've been preaching on comes from a book entitled Christmas is Not Your Birthday by Mike Slaughter. And, and in one of the paragraphs in this book, he, he, he has sort of a result or highlights the results of, of, of what many of us ex experience when it comes to Christmas Day. This is what he says. He says, then after weeks of pressure and preparation, all for the purpose of creating one perfect day in an imperfect year, Someone's upset because they didn't get the present they wanted. A toy is already broken. Grandpa drank too much. And dad called grandma a bad word. That's what some people's Christmases are all about. They experience it. It's, it's, it's anything but perfect. And so I want you to, I'm, I want you to hear me say, that's okay it's okay it's not about being perfect some of this I do speak from personal experience when it comes to Christmas um, this year will mark the 25th time the 25th um, anniversary time we gather to to remember my grandmother's passing uh, that occurred six days before Christmas December 19th, 1989, my grandmother passed away. And, and this was the grandmother whose house we went to um, for Christmas. The grandmother who 
fixed a, an amazing meal that I can still taste 25 years later in the back of my mind in some depths of, of roast beef and potatoes and, and green beans. This is the grandmother whose house we would sneak out of our rooms that we were sleeping in at the ages of six, seven, eight, and nine to go take a look at our gifts that Santa had dropped off already. This was four, three, four o'clock in the morning. Nobody else did that in here, right? And sneak back into the room and, and act like you slept through the night. It was a big deal. And her passing was sudden. She died of a heart attack. We got a call. I still remember the exact scene, the way that played out. So for me, Christmas, the, the perfect Christmas that I had experienced the previous nine years that I had a memory of for about five years, it, it changed. And it took some time to get used to that. And my parents, in a moment of, of sheer brilliance, the next year rolls around, and so instead of, of sitting around doing the same thing we had always done at Christmas time, my parents threw us a curveball. They took us to Disney World, the happiest place on the planet, supposedly. That's a place that's stressful and hectic too, but anyways, it, it's supposed to be. It, it took our minds off of sort of that realization that Christmas would not be the same as it was the previous year. And that was okay. Because see, while we want to glitz and glamour it up every year, and it is a time of sheer celebration and joy, don't get me wrong, trying to achieve a certain level of perfection on Christmas, it misses the point altogether. Because see, this, I think, speaks to a larger point in general in our walk with Christ. And that's this, that, that this idea that if we do the right thing, then the wrong won't show up. That if we just live our lives the right way, we can avoid the pain and the suffering and the hurt that, doesn't, that, it, that exists in the world. Maybe it won't come around us. And that when pain and suffering and hurt does come, well then we must have done, we must have done something wrong. But friends, that's not really the way God works. You see, I don't think faith always follows a, a cause and effect pattern. I look to the, the characters in, in, in our Christmas story to, to have uh, meaning or, or, or to demonstrate this for me. I, I think of Joseph, and Joseph is described by the biblical text as being a righteous man. And in, in those connotations, that meant he lived rightly. He lived the right way. He did what he was supposed to do. And yet, think about what his experience must have been like. The woman whom he was engaged to be married gets pregnant. Now we have hindsight on our, on our side and on our favor. So, so when we look at, back at the story of Joseph, or like characters like Joseph, we tend to, to glorify and to sanitize the story a bit. But it had to have been disappointing for him, right? This man to have done everything he, like he was supposed to do to be called righteous in the eyes of others and yet he finds himself, it had to have been disappointing. But yet he made room for God to act. And, and then there's Mary, not, not to, to, to see what she responded because for Mary it wasn't for her to simply say, and I said this in the Sunday school class a little while ago, it wasn't for Mary to simply look out and to say, how can I be, how can this be? How am I going to give birth to this amazing child and this blessing? That was not how Mary responded. Mary simply looked out and said, how am I going to have a child at all? There was fear. That would have been intimidating. What am I going to tell my parents? What am I going to tell my soon-to-be husband? What's going to happen? And 
And at some point, whether that was after time in which she thought about it, or whether it was when the God's spirit moved within her, Mary simply responds, Here I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. We read that a few moments ago. You see, this, this idea came up a few minutes ago, or a few, uh, a couple hours ago when we were talking about our, our book that we've been working through, Not a Silent Night by Adam Hamilton. And there was a paragraph that, that sort of stuck out to me in response or in, or in, in light of this sermon. And, and this is what he said. He says, the entire Christmas story is in part a story about the reversal of values in God's kingdom. Mary, a peasant girl, was chosen to bear the king. Jesus was born in a stable because there was no room at the inn. The first people God invites to see the Christ are the night shift shepherds. And then he finally says, The story is a call for us to humble ourselves before God. And I would go and take it one step further. It's a call for us to humble ourselves before God. But it also, it also encourages us to give up on the idea of being perfect. And to simply be present with each other and with God. Making room and space for God to continue to act in our lives. Give up on perfect. Amen? Amen.